Hello and welcome to the Photo Op Podcast. This is a very special episode. Yes, it is. Very, very special. It's so special. We're going to get a little bit of applause. Hey. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, audience. Why, why is this such a special episode? <laughs> this is episode 100. 100 of the times. Photo Op Podcast. Yeah. If this is uh, your, your first episode, welcome. Um, you got yeah. a lot to catch up on like 50 hours <laughs> yeah yeah it's a little bit anyway i'm ben lucas and i'm Stuart marlandis and this is photo up the podcast where we talk about all things photo and video yeah. so okay. now in the triple digits now in the triple digits so we have a special kind of three-part episode coming to you first uh part is going to be listener question uh the second part is going to be uh we are going to talk about the absolute best photo stuff of all time either just stuff in general or stuff that is important to us personally uh, we each came up with a top 10 list so you are getting the top 20 things from us today yep um, of all time and then and then we we have a we have a fun uh special piece of entertainment for you to close out today's episode which we'll we'll get to a little bit later so first our listener question uh, I don't have it in front of me. It came from me. <laughs> it came from me from last time. So last episode, we talked about um, budgeting for your business. How do you afford all the expensive stuff? You don't. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, at the very end, we kind of ended on the question, kind of ran out of time a little bit more like actually. Mm -hmm. But we ended on the question um, that something at least I feel like is important. Maybe none of you care at all. But mm -hmm. what is the difference between overhead costs and scaling costs? And I'm about to say something controversial Scaling costs are great. Give me more scaling costs. I want scaling costs. You all want more day costs? Long. Yes, I want Who more scaling costs. Who wants more costs, Ben? Me, me. Mm. This guy wants more scaling costs. Give it to me. <laughs> Give me more costs. Okay, but first, let's define those things to talk about why one is good and why one is terrible. So, overhead cost is something that whether you do a million dollars in business or zero dollars in business, you have to pay for it anyway. Some examples: my Adobe subscription. What are what are some examples of overhead costs you've got? Oh, um, I mean, everything. Rent. <laughs> right. yeah. 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 If you're renting a studio space, yeah. um, the maintenance on your camera gear, like buying batteries, like utilities, are, all you, of the really fun stuff. Utilities. <laughs> um, if you have any um, subscriptions or licenses or anything mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. that, whether you do uh, $0 in business or a million dollars in business, all of that stuff is crap you have to pay for anyway. And those are bad. You want to keep your overhead as low as possible because if your overhead is too high you're gonna have a bad time running a profitable business now sure. here's what i mean by scaling cost my scaling costs are the costs that only go up as i make more money so for example if um i am doing so many client galleries that i have to up the um tier that i pay for for my online client gallery software mm -hmm. Well, it's the reason why I'm paying more money is because I have so much revenue coming in that to be able to handle all that to bandwidth, justify that. yeah, I need more space, right? If I'm just upping the space and not getting paid for it, that's that's not great. But um, another example is, oh no, I paid Bay Photo five thousand dollars last month. Mm -hmm. Why did I pay them five thousand dollars? Because I made so much money in prints. So many people ordered stuff from me, and guess what? A print cost is a very small fraction of the revenue that came in. So For if sure. I were to have paid, you know, Bay Photo five thousand dollars last month, think about how much more revenue came in. So um, a friend of mine used to run um, a subscription box. Mm -hmm. And so for her company, the subscription box, she was testing out different forms of marketing. And one thing that she found is, and this is not true for everybody, especially probably not for photographers, but for people that sell a very inexpensive subscription-based thing, and this at least worked for her you know, several years back. So for her, uh, Facebook ads were the thing where for every dollar she spent in Facebook ads, she would earn $5. And so she tested this at scale. So she started with, you know, $100. Then she did $1,000. And then she's like, next month, I'm going to put $10,000 into it. Because for, <laughs> which, which is like, scary. Ooh, ooh, scary. scary number. <laughs> but she had been testing this and ramping up mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it kept working at scale for every dollar she put in. She got $5 back. And wouldn't you take that? Deal. Yeah, for sure. For every one dollar bill you I give you, you'll give me a five. That is like, an incredible amount of return. That is, yeah. Like if you have something that is the only, it's kind of like when people complain about paying taxes of mm -hmm. like, 
okay, but you're really only paying taxes if you made a ton of money. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, Asterisks on that, our tax system is super effed up here in the U.S., so that's not necessarily true. But yeah. let's just <laughs> let's just say for the purposes of this, of like if it is something that your cost only goes up because you're making a ton of money, congratulations, you're making a ton of money. That's a great problem mm -hmm. to have. I'll take that problem over, oh my God, I have all this overhead, no way to pay it off. For sure. Any day. So scaling costs, amazing. Overhead costs, bad. Um, figure out what for you is overhead versus scaling. Um, and if it's a scaling cost that brings in income, jack it up. For sure. There you go. So um, yeah, that's kind of uh, falls back to last week's business budgeting episode. And I wanted uh, us to be able to kind of cover that. So I know it's not really a listener question. It comes from me. But hey, close enough. Um, I do have another listener question in the pipeline that we're going to answer next time. But for now, we've got plenty to do in this episode. So yeah, without further ado, uh, we are we are ready to talk about the top photo things of all time. Absolutely. All right. So, Stuart, what are your top 10 photo best photo stuff of all time? All right. Well, let me get my list. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, the best photo stuff of all time, and, and some of these may be stretching the definition a little bit, but uh, bear with us. Um, in no particular order, I'm going to start with the Nikon F mount legendary legendary mount so the nikon f mount uh was the mount that nikon used for decades and decades and decades until they just started going to mirrorless and it is only now kind of moving on although they still have adapters to yeah. um adapt the f mount if you, if you have one of those legendary pieces of glass with an adapter mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. it's still great so um why the f mount is so particularly important to me is uh well my dad uh was a photographer he has since retired but he was a photographer and everything he shot with uh was the nikon f mount and so i learned bumbling along as a kid using the F mount and the absolute top tier. <laughs> yeah. And unfortunately, uh, what the F mount gave me beyond um, expecting all of these great lenses to work on all of these different cameras all the time was uh, a let's say a rich taste. <laughs> like I, I was used to a gear that I could never afford um, else uh, otherwise and was used to that for a very long period of time. Um, so moving into the world where I started paying for my own things was difficult, um, but it meant that my taste was you taste always very high. On a beans yeah. and rice budget. Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> um, so cool that I could use that. Thanks, dad. Not so cool. It kind of warped my perceptions of equipment for a long time, and I had to get over it. Um, related to that is the Fujifilm S series. Now, this is going to be a camera that probably a lot of people don't remember. It wasn't particularly notable. Um, it wasn't particularly popular in comparison to the classics from Nikon and Canon of its day. But um, it was unique in that, one, it used the F mount. So props F mount. But two, it used this really interesting sensor that Fujifilm developed with that used uh, octagonal pixels. So instead of the standard square pixels with three subpixels that you see everywhere else, they were actual little octagons. Um, now, this gave you better XY resolution, um, but your diagonal resolution was worse, just a geometry. Um, why this is important to me is it was something that um, I thought was frankly just really cool um as a younger person and it I, I was always kind of defending this camera i feel like like i shot with this camera for a long time it was the first camera that like i really like had on me all the time that i used all the time um and it was i never met another person that shot with this camera and so i was always talking about how this technology was really cool and different and here's why it's helpful um that resolution thing that I mentioned before. And it kind of, I don't know, maybe it's just because I like, I dig my feet in more if I meet any resistance. But instead of being uh, convinced that other cameras were better because they were more standard, uh, I increasingly just pushed back and said, no, this is really cool. This alternative kind of tech is really cool. And that led me later on to try uh, transflective mirrors in Sony's like Minolta acquisition stuff at, at the time and kind of um, inspired me going forward to continue to look at 
what's not necessarily the mainstream, what's upcoming, what's a different, what could be useful, um, what is kind of out of the box uh, equipment wise. Um, so yeah, Fujifilm S series, you, cool I mean, series you of definitely, cameras. Uh, you definitely love the tech of, oh yeah of a thing mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um i i honestly do not give a crap about the tech <laughs> of a thing i care what can i do with the thing and you're yeah. like but the underlying tech is so cool yeah, yeah. which is why i think we had very uh different perspectives when the litro came out mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you're like oh this tech is really cool i'm like yes but what can you do with it and then uh, unfortunately and then they didn't do much they, with it they had a very exciting first step and i was the only naysayer and then mm-hmm. when the company failed i'm like i told you yeah. all of you yelled at me but i was right you were right you were right uh moving on more cameras uh i'm gonna say gopro in general uh, for me specifically it was the hero 3 is where i got into gopros that's when i finally took the leap and and felt that they were worth uh my time and money but gopro has opened a tremendous amount of doors for me personally i've done a lot of shooting with gopros personally and professionally um work a fleet of them i have a lot of gopros um stuff that i shot on gopros actually att- attracted the attention of gopro the company um on more than one occasion uh they were sort of an early uh i don't know an early experiment for me in in non-dslr form factors and it really worked out um I was in the very early edge of people working on uh, with drones and early on they didn't have dedicated cameras like they do now and so you would mount a GoPro or another action camera to the drone and shoot with that and so I was somebody that did a lot of that work that got me a decent amount of attention um, which is why the next thing is the DJI Phantom the original um, now I was building um, you were doing drones before that I was came doing out. drones before this to be fair um, but this was kind of a it made this it easy dramatic, and accessible. Yeah, this was a dramatic moment for me. I picked one up and it was so much easier than the janky rigs that I built. Um, but also it was very easy for everybody else. And there were a few years where I held on to that market a little bit where I was making a lot of money uh, shooting with stuff that not everybody was really using yet. Unfortunately, the Phantom kickstarted the process of everybody getting into drones. And I have since largely abandoned that market professionally. <laughs> but yeah. I, I, I threatened to come back into it here and there. Um, I still have drones. I still buy DJI stuff because it's frankly great but um it was a big shift both positive and negative uh next one the canon 5d mark ii i didn't own this camera but this camera is the one that put dslr as a video uh, piece of equipment on the mark uh, on the map now the mark one kind of started it but the mark ii is where they really kicked it out the very first short film shot on a dslr was uh vincent lafay's short shot on the 5d mark ii Mm -hmm. and this is honestly um of like look what we can do with low light look what we can do in small cramped locations on moving vehicles look what the possibilities are because professional cinematography prior to this point required ginormous oversized rigs and this and like six figure rigs not just big rigs but yeah, expensive. So rigs. not only did it democratize it and make it small, but it also made it accessible and open the possibilities of what cinematography could do without CGI or six figure budgets. For it sure. Was insane. Yeah, it was uh, the market, even just a few years after the 5D Mark II looked so different than the market just the five years prior it was a landslide shift in the industry absolutely. and something that absolutely i really appreciated as somebody that was from an, an early age um kind of interested in thinking outside the box interested in looking at how you could use equipment different ways um for that to be um underlined and supported um so well by both a piece of equipment even though i never ended up buying that piece of equipment but then the industry as a whole was a very exciting time um so the 5d mark ii it, b- before you move on, I do do have kind of an add on to mm-hmm. that. The 5D Mark II, so monumentally important. Um, what I shoot with right now is a discontinued camera, the 5D Mark III. Mm-hmm. So obviously just one step up. What's the difference between the two and the three? Um, better sensor for better low light, uh, better autofocus, a faster burst speed, and um, they actually added a headphone jack so you can monitor your audio oh, yeah. levels. That was important. That was the huge kind of like, ah, oh, why didn't we think of that before? But otherwise, like basically your numbers went up. Yeah, but it yeah. didn't do any, besides the headphone jack, it didn't do anything drastically different. The 5D Mark II is still a phenomenal camera. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is definitely what kick-started all of the 
camera is a small handheld DSLR mirrorless revolution getting into the video sphere. For sure. Yeah. I mean, Canon knocked it out of the park. I mean, the, the 5D line in general is legendary. Um, as you said, you, you still use them today. Like I own four of they're them. Still, they're, <laughs> still, they're still great to this day. I mean, they like, they like killed it from practically Mark 1, but really Mark 2 is where they Mark, hit their stride. Mark 2 was really yeah. where it's at, yeah. 5D Mark II. Um, following up on that, like you said, this kickstarted the DSLR video market and it has since moved on. The entire industry has now basically moved on to mirrorless. Um, and in parentheses, I'm going to say mirrorless Panasonic, Panas- Panasonic, Panasonic, why not? Panasonic. Panasonic and Sony. Panasonic. Um, nope, nope, nope. It's, <laughs> it's, it's Panasonic, Panasonic now. <laughs> um, we are filming this episode on a Lumix a G85, a Which Panasonic. Is Panasonic. Yep. Panasonic uh, Micro Four Thirds mirrorless. Um, I was in this weird kind of Sony Minolta land and leapt into the E mount on the Sony side, uh, which Canon kind of started the industry shift. And then Sony came by and said, okay, well, what if we like outcompete like full on cinema cameras for like a, a couple thousand bucks in a body? Um, and that they just kind of. I mean, they they obviously saw a market and wanted to take that market. Yeah. And so they just started putting insane. I mean, they competed with themselves. Like that was the interesting thing about Sony is Sony has a huge and rich uh, history in doing cinema equipment. And they were totally cool with who cares? We're going to put this this insane cinema capability, these amazing sensors in increasingly cheap and small bodies. Um, and that just caused another shift. I mean, the, the A7S line of just like seeing in the dark, everybody had to pay attention and compete with that. It shifted yeah. the industry forward again. If, if you guys are kind of new to the cinema sphere um, when it comes to equipment, if you think a $6,000 camera is expensive, oh, no. no, 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 no. Yeah, it's expensive for a still camera, mm-hmm. but when it comes to cinema quality video... Oh, just uh, just type in Ari Alexa and watch your brain explode. Yeah, or any of the high end. I mean, even the high end, like it's kind of pushed prices down in general because you still have the Ari market. But, you know, even like Red um, came out and sort of I mean, they, they did more cinema cameras, but still kind of going with the still, mirrorless still for DSLR kind of thing for, um, for a full red package. Yeah, you know, it's it's uh, even even Sony's top end DSLR right now, which is the Alpha 1, is $6,500, like so cheap in comparison. So they really push the industry forward, both in quality, but um, also in price. Uh, I still can't afford one, but they are cheap, (laughs) relatively speaking. Relatively speaking. Um, And then Panasonic kind of filled in the gaps. Like they really ran with the Micro Four Thirds format. They're kind of the the cheap and cheerful in comparison, perform extremely well. Like they're the bang for the buck king, where Sony might be the funny enough, even though we just talked about how it's not expensive. Sony might be the expensive end of the mirrorless video world. Uh, Panasonic is the, like, you're getting in a tremendous amount for your yeah. dollar. And the GH3, GH line in general, the GH3, 4, 5, 6, um, those have all been used for, like, feature-length films. Mm-hmm. Um, really amazing stuff for these tiny cameras that I think people would otherwise overlook, but they just, they kill it. I mean, we shoot on one all the time. I have another one. They're great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, Panasonic in general. Panasonic is the good stuff. Um, next, moving into the software realm, I'm going to say Adobe. Um, I've been using Adobe software in general since, like, as almost my earliest memories, been, like the mid '90s. I've been 90s. using it since uh, sixth grade. Yeah, I've been using it since I was probably like six years old <laughs> oh geez oh my god oh my god thanks dad for being a professional photographer and and also <laughs> i i will also interject uh hashtag not sponsored this is honestly just stuff that we mm-hmm, use mm-hmm. um if you guys are interested in hearing us talk about adobe at length um we did a full episode where we talk about adobe alternatives yep. but um spoiler alert adobe is still better yeah they uh they've i i can't i can't believe how well they've held on to their market for yeah. this long decades and decades and they still the, there is a yeah. lot of competition but none of the competition comes close it's kind of no. like when um going back to gopro whenever they're like well what about all these chinese knockoffs can any of them be better no they're not better yeah yeah <laughs> There's always trade-offs. Um, but yeah, Adobe, uh, I've been, I have lived in that 
in their software longer than I think any other tool that I've ever used. I've seen it shift from when practically everything was Mac only um, in like the late 90s to, I mean, having Photoshop on your phone today. It's It's been this kind of through line in my life. I mean, even now where I'm not explicitly a photographer for work, I use Adobe products pretty much every day. Mm -hmm. um, I have practically made a career out of having a general knowledge of Adobe products in general, and it continues to pay dividends. Um, so it's been great. I mean, I have clutched the most random things out of Photoshop that you're never supposed to do. I've done graphic design work in it. I've done all sorts of stuff and that you're not supposed to do. And motion they graphics. They discontinued all of their 3D rendering yep. stuff, but yep. there was a lot of that going on too. I, I have done so many weird things with it. Um, but yeah, Adobe props. Um, I have struggles with the company, but they just continue to dominate and for good reason. Their product is, is great is great. Yep. Um, this is a little bit of a weird one. Mini DV. Now I'm not naming one particular camera oh, because man. I worked with a bunch of different mini DV cameras, but believe it or not, kids, <clears throat> we used to shoot stuff on tape for video and then you had to ingest the tape into a computer before you could. When uh, I was in college, <laughs> I it. spent many late nights sitting in the library running my mini DV yep, tape yep. so that I could actually have a digital version of it that could be edited. Yeah, I, uh, boy, through college, I shot on mini DV, um, outside of school. I shot on mini DV. I mean, mini DV was the place to be for a long period of time. Oh, man. I just, I just lived in that tape deck room, <laughs> just kind of like passed out in a chair, just laid out with like, you know, soda yep. chip crumbs. Yeah. I should waiting for the uh, DV to, I should explain a little bit. So mini DV is a, is a tape format. Um, so it's basically if you're not a cassette, familiar, but for video, yeah, if you're not familiar with it, it's, it's basically like a video cassette, but it's much smaller, um, for video. It's aimed more at the pro market, although consumer stuff came out, but ingesting mini DV footage took the same amount of time as the footage that was shot. So if you shot two hours of footage, it took two, it took hours, two to hours to ingest it into a computer. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so uh, as you said, lots of, of late nights sitting around a tape deck or a precariously perched camera plugged into a firewire cord and if you bumped uh, it, you'd ruin everything. And you just, have to start over. Yeah, oh, you have God. to start over. Um, it was... It was a really both an interesting time technologically, but also to me, um, it has a tremendous amount of nostalgia. It's one of those things that like I kind of understand nostalgia better where I'm like, this was objectively worse in every way. But part of me was like, <laughs> but part of me was like, it's still kind of fun. Um, the no, physicality no, of it Get was really interesting. Get, someone <laughs> mute his mic. But I do have one thing that's good. I do have one thing that's good about it. That's legitimately good because it took so long to ingest. If you, you you needed to think about what you were shooting, uh, much like yes, film. Yes, 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 yes. So you couldn't just well, you could, I guess, if you're shooting an event. But if you were shooting you something, you wanted to you edit did. it together. You wanted to do something narrative. You know, as a post-produced kind of thing. If you just kept shooting, you would have to deal with all that time later, not just in the editing bay, but ingesting it. And so it made you more careful. It made you a lot more careful, kind of like film does. You you think about it a little bit more. Unfortunately, I've gotten way back into that lazy habit because digital is so easy that I don't really care as much anymore. But You can shoot it, scrub through it really quick yep. and delete the clip. Yeah. So we, we kind of aren't in that land anymore, but I kind of feel like people shooting video should start on a tape format just to attempt to put their brain in a little bit of a better place <laughs> even though you'll eventually give it up there's um <laughs> there's this one store that definitely no longer exists but i remember it very vividly mm. you walk in and they have about 50 to 100 tvs mm -hmm. lining mm -hmm. the wall and every single one of these had a vhs or oh, dv boy. cassette so that you could pay them to digitize your stuff for you and everyone's home stuff was just playing on these TVs <laughs> because if you shot 50 hours of tape, it required 50 hours to ingest. And there was a dude who was just sitting there kind of recording all of these things. And when the tape ends, he plucks it out yep, and puts yep. your new stack in. And that was a real job. What a world. What a world. Yeah. It's so easy now. <laughs> I mean, you know, we're practically on the other side of, of SD cards, seemingly. I mean, like with how much storage you can have in your your pocket all the time. They have like terabyte SD yeah, cards now. It's, it, it's amazing. It's amazing. So mini DV uh, had one good thing, many bad things about it. Um, 
the iMac G4, speaking of things that had like one good thing and many bad things about <laughs> it, this was the machine that I mostly learned how to edit on. Um, the iMac G4, if you're not familiar with it, it was one of those I'm like not familiar with it, it was one of those I failed hated <laughs> apple with my entire being until like after college so it was one of those failed experiments that apple did um it was known as the sunflower mac the lamp mac it was the one where it was kind of a half half sphere of white and then it had this well kind of lamp style arm with a flat panel display attached to it so you could spin it around you could you could place it anywhere you wanted you Don't can you tilt it up and down of these i have garage? i have a pallet of these <clears throat> yeah okay just um, which i bought more than a decade ago and i still haven't done anything with them i just keep carting them around every time i move it's really great <laughs> um so the imac g4 really interestingly designed machine um i still like his design uh i liked the software a lot at the time um i it was uh i was using final cut something at the time and i actually edited on final cut for a large percentage of my career and then in college switched over to premiere um i had access to premiere but i never really used it um and then the big shift was when they went to final cut 10 or x or whatever you want to refer to it as and they really dumbed it down they have since pulled some of that stuff back but that was my impetus to really jump full full into premiere um but anyway uh lots of nostalgia for the g4 um objectively not a great machine but i loved the design someday i'm going to like make a modern version of it um but uh yeah it's a machine i learned to edit on lots of nostalgia for that boy those like circular mice those sucked they were so bad <laughs> they were so bad they were like weird hockey pucks yep i could i could forgive the hardware being not the greatest because it was in this weird little half dome the monitors are actually pretty good and being able to adjust them was like an early thing in the industry but some of the peripherals were terrible Jeez, um firewire though good stuff uh and the last one leds um this is just so generic, but uh, this is another thing that I think I think has shifted the industry and something that I just appreciate from a tech perspective. Um, I mean, LEDs were a tremendous innovation in the first place. You know, we started with blue, these blue LEDs. Um, that was a big deal to have a light emitting source that took so little power and was so adaptable. And we have done so many crazy things with them. I mean, we have LED strobes, we have LED video lights, we have RGB panel lights. We've like changed all of the, our housing lights towards LEDs. But um, it's one of the things that uh, I just really enjoy experimenting with and I've been able to be creative with LEDs, especially RGB LEDs in ways that I wouldn't be able to easily with any other light source. Um, it made the, it made shooting video with like really vibrant colors, you know, really kind of pushing the limits, really artistic stuff, much more approachable and much cheaper than it used to be. You used to have to rent or buy crazy expensive, like halogen fixtures and, put plastic mm -hmm. over it at least for video and, and hope, hope that it all melt. worked out yeah i hope you don't melt it i, re um, I, re I remember uh my very uh, one of my very first photo jobs um i was basically turned my um this is not a finished basement this is mm -hmm. more of a crawl space that someone happened to put wood pallets down on that this that and it was tall enough that you could almost stand up in yeah, just so about. i i had to sit down and i kind of turned this weird little like it was like five feet wide by like 10 feet long and i turned that into my studio and you helped me get it out yep and there was one outlet down there and the thing is if you you had a 500 watt light that 500 watt light literally took 500 mm -hmm, watts mm -hmm. and i kept blowing my breaker much to the annoyance of my wife and neighbors because <laughs> uh, it was like a duplex mm -hmm. um <laughs> why i kept blowing my breakers uh especially on the neighbor side janky freaking house anyway yeah um but yeah i had to buy leds because one i needed more lights than i had outlets and wattage for but yep. also like i didn't want to burn the place down as i was recording for hours at a time mm. in this tiny little space so no it was honestly just revolutionary um and now led is absolutely the standard yep yep yeah another industry shift um and it's allowed for all sorts of cool things that you couldn't do before. I mean, like we've done experimenting with uh, like lighting miniatures that 
you couldn't reasonably do with old style huge power hungry lights no like straight up no, you could you, not do you grab a yeah. tiny little light cube and yeah. you stick it down under yep. the miniature and now and you have great. up lighting like, without yeah. leds that doesn't happen mm -hmm. yeah among many 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 other things um but yeah that is my top 10 list in no particular order of the best photo things of all time get, get in my opinion applause going yeah for there. yeah let's get some applause really delayed applause because i have to change hey, to another bank there we go <laughs> <laughs> and we'll be right back after these commercial messages Hi, this episode is brought to you by me because we're not sponsored by anybody. I know I'm wearing a black rapid shirt, but that's because once upon a time I did some work for them and uh, this was some free swag that they gave me for doing all the photos on their website. True story. Anyway, um, I represent the current uh, sponsorship of the show. No brands. <laughs> <laughs> no brands. All right. This is my commercial. <laughs> Thank you very much. Anyway, uh, if you'd like to uh, help out the show, um, sponsor us, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, uh, you can go to my Patreon, uh, patreon.com mm -hmm. slash nom creative. There are two tip jars there, one for my personal YouTube channel and one for this show, the photo op podcast. Uh, right now it's just tip jar. It's a dollar. Mm -hmm. So you can give a dollar to the show. Um, all of that money pretty much goes to Stuart since he's the only one who's put any <laughs> money into this show. Um, but uh, thank you so much to all of our Patreon subscribers. If you would like to support us and the show, if you find this entertaining or educational every dollar helps so that is patreon.com slash nom creative back to our show help keep our influencer dreams alive welcome back to the photo op podcast before the break uh we talked about stewart's top 10 best mm -hmm. stuff of all time and now we're going to talk about mine now ben's in the hot seat now i'm in the hot seat best photo stuff of all time so uh, the first thing I have to start with is Costco. Costco. I mean, Kirkland Signature, good yeah, stuff. Yes. Yeah. So, I'm into it. So um, when they sell camera bundles, essentially it is the same price as the camera body, except you get free kit lenses, free bag, free screen cleaner, mm -hmm, free mm -hmm. extra battery. Just like they just throw in a ton of extra stuff that you get. For sure. So um, – Honestly, any camera that they sell is good enough to start on. Um, if you already have a camera and you're looking to upgrade, that is one thing altogether. Mm -hmm, but if mm -hmm. you are looking for a very first camera, you cannot go wrong with whatever. Um, I generally tell people just kind of like walk into a camera store, pick stuff up, and see what feels good in your hands. Um, yep, yep. But lacking that, go to Costco. My very first camera um, was actually my textbook book budget um, I had $500 a quarter for textbooks and that quarter I spent it all on a camera because I walked into a class and they said, if you do not own a camera, you will not pass this class. So, mm. uh, <laughs> the next morning I go to Costco, Brutal. I buy a camera and I show up to class with this unopened Costco kit camera box. And everyone's like this motherfucker. And then you Are filmed you? the first unboxing video. <laughs> I didn't. I did not. No, but everyone in this class is like, this motherfucker. Are you kidding me right now with the brand new camera? It's so fancy. It's a Camera Rebel XSI. It's got 12. Ooh. ooh. It's got 12 fancy. megapixels. It shoots three frames per second. I was the height of luxury back then. Indeed, indeed. Nice. Um, by today's st standards, that camera sucks, but I still have it because... Uh, nostalgia also i'm a little bit of a hoarder and have a hard time getting rid of things but Should mount it in a frame neither, that is neither here nor there um number two on my list a color checker Ooh, color checker. color checker i should have had it with me here but um i use the color checker by x right um just but honestly my first color checker was just like three cards on a lanyard and I just, hey, it works. I just fanned them out, um, but eventually they got dirty and scuffed, and the gray wasn't quite gray anymore. It had a little too much red in it just from being so dirty. Yeah. Um, but no, the x right color checker, um, I use it all the time. Um, I use it to white balance. I use it when uh, I'm trying to dial in like really specific like blues and reds and oranges. Um, camera sensors have a hard time kind of rendering those super vibrant colors, mm -hmm. and the x right color checker can create a new color profile that can bring all that stuff back. But even on a super basic level of just like, if I walk into a room and there is candlelight 
and uh, incandescent light and maybe a fluorescent bulb and a window. And I'm trying to add in a daylight balanced flash. (laughs) I'm just like, I don't know what's happening right now. I don't know what the color is supposed to be. So what I do is I use the color checker. I just, I just kind of shoot on auto and like fix it in post. Oh, I can't believe I just said that. Uh, No, but the auto white balance for the, like my camera tries to figure it out and it's eh, close-ish, but wrong. But what I'll do is I'll click on the color checker in post, sync everything up. So now it is all actually like technically correct. Um, But then that is my starting point. And I can look at it and go, wow, this looks bad. And I can tweak it until it looks good to my eye. But at least I start in a place that's neutral and neutralizes all of the freaking wonkiness of all the random light Mm -hmm. sources. So if you've ever noticed, like if you shoot somebody photo or video and they have a red shirt on and it looks like blown out in a way, that's how you fix that. That is how you fix that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's both white balance and exposure and saturation. So yep. you need to tweak all and like luminance. You need to tweak all of those things. And a color checker helps you infinitely with that. If only sensors were good enough that they represented what we see perfectly. We're we don't live in that close. world. We're getting pretty we're close. Getting we're not quite there yet. <laughs> um, next is off camera flash. Um, so my very first off camera flash. Oh God. What was it? I think it was a Victor Smith. It cost hmm. about $20. <laughs> and it had an opt it it was it basically looked like um uh, a deck of cards mm, mm. and on the skinny side of the deck of cards it had a flash and it had a big red panel that was its optical oh, sensor oh yeah yeah and so it would flash when it saw another flash so i would hook these uh, i would like put them on stacks of books or like hang them from like the door jam in my um apartment do what you and- need to do and just or like tape them to things um, because uh, I think they had mounts, but the mounts sucked, and I didn't really own equipment that you could mount things to. For sure. So I had an on-camera flash that would just aim up at the ceiling, and then these would give me my directional light. And I did so much stuff with these really bad, cheap twenty-dollars lights. But um, if you don't learn how to use light and you don't learn how to sculpt light, then um, you're Honestly, you haven't really learned your craft. Mm-hmm. Um, so there are definitely people like Danny Diamond who are natural light, but he he knows how to use off-camera light. Mm-hmm. And because he knows how to use off-camera light, he is a master at finding the thing that he wants naturally occurring in the world, whether that is a window or a lamppost or something. And if you don't know how to change and sculpt um, off-camera light is how you do that. So everyone, everyone out there, Get an off-camera flash. Get in it. Get an off-camera light. Buy some LED panels. Do something. Learn how to light and sculpt your subjects. That is that is like the one key element to being a photographer. And I cannot say that enough. If you're a natural light photographer, I hate you with every fiber of my being. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Not really. Um, <laughs> All I need is the little pop-up flash that it, that's at the top of the camera. Get right. Yeah. Get out. That one doesn't have one. The camera must not be that good. It, 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 <laughs> it's so true. Actually, uh, so so you recently got married, and yes. after all of the festivities were over, um, at the end of the night, uh, one of your guests was trying to take a photo of some of their family oh, members no. on the balcony in the sunset, mm-hmm. and they're like, I don't understand how to do it. I'm like, turn on your pop-up flash. <laughs> and they're like, what? And they're like, oh, my camera must not be good enough. It doesn't have one. I'm like, no, that means you have a really expensive camera. <laughs> That actually means you have a great camera and you're supposed to have an external flash unit, but you don't. Oh, I'm so sorry. But um, so then I pulled out my uh, phone and I turned on the little like flashlight on the phone. Hey, like, whatever I got you. I got you. So ho- hopefully your friend, cousin, family member, whoever, whoever that was on the balcony got got a nice sunset photo. There were a couple of them wandering around. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> um. Next up on my list, number four, online training slash in-person workshops. Um, I have a degree in interdisciplinary visual arts with a focus in design and photography. And that means absolutely nothing to anyone. Literally no one cares at all. I hold my diploma and cry at night. That is, (laughs) um, that is how that works. But no, I pretty much learned everything I know from online trainings and in-person workshops. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
I will, I, it has been a goal of mine for a while now to make some of these online trainings and I've kind of dipped, well, I've had jobs where I've made online trainings for other people, but I would like to do it for myself. Um, that is kind of why I started this YouTube channel of like yeah. all of my online trainings right now are short form tutorials that are all absolutely free. Um, hopefully by the new year ish, I will actually have some longer in depth courses on random stuff. Um, but hard to do. It turns out it is very difficult and time consuming to put together, especially when, when I'm doing it for someone else, that's my job. I'm getting paid to do it when I'm doing it for myself. I have to find the time on top of doing paid things to yep. do it. And it always, just kind of gets put by the wayside you know but um no that's how i learned um so sign up for online trainings but some people just like it is nice and this goes directly into my next uh thing number five being able to ask professionals stupid questions <laughs> i know that's not a physical tangible thing but it is it is my absolute top I used to have more of a problem with this, I feel like. Um, but I, I, now I have increasingly no shame and I'm just going to ask stupid questions all the time. Yeah, Why not? no. So <laughs> there were there were two kind of um, moments or interactions kind of in my development that have fundamentally kind of shifted how I kind of think about things. Um, one of them was there was a just news journalist, some person who had this big steady cam rig and it had these giant freaking battery packs on it and he, mm. with like the chargers and everything. And I asked him, I'm like, hey, steady cams, I know how they work. They're not gimbals. <laughs> They're steady cams. Why does a steady cam have a battery? I don't I honestly like <laughs> I look it up and when I Google that question, the results give me nothing. And I had the audacity to walk up to this <laughs> working professional as how he was packing up his gear and ask him a question. It was on the UW campus. Mm, yeah. So like there's that. Yeah. It's not like I just walked up to him in a Starbucks or something. But um What's wrong with your equipment? Yeah. <laughs> Explain. But I'm, but I'm like, hey, can I ask you a question? He's like, yeah, shoot. Um, and it was like, why does the steady cam have a battery? Like, it doesn't need a battery. I don't understand. He said, well, you attach a lot of peripherals to the steady cam. And now, instead of having to rebalance or replace each of those batteries individually, the steady cam battery runs everything your camera, your monitor, your mic. Such a cool setup. And I'm like, oh, I don't understand why that was never on Google. Why was that not an easy answer? Mm -hmm. It's so obvious now, but at the time, it was a very stupid question. I didn't understand it. And what he told me is whenever someone takes the time to ask you a question, take the time to answer it. Yeah. And that is honestly why I like teach now and why I uh, love your questions. So, um, yeah, no, the, that was great. And then the other kind of fundamental thing is I went to uh, a seminar where Dave Hill, legendary photographer, he used to do composites and now he does more kind of analog film stuff. Um, he kind of walked through how he shot his stuff and how he built it. And there were all these tutorials online of like, here's how you use Photoshop to fake the Dave Hill effect. But like they all looked just a little bit wrong. A little off. And when I saw how he did it, it was honestly just a long series of very easy steps. And I'm like, I know how to do step one, step two, step three, step four. But all of the tutorials online say, you know what? Do step one, skip all of these other ones, try step six, and like, yeah, close enough. It's like, no, <laughs> if you have the patience to go through and do all the easy things, now your one composite piece is done. And you just have to repeat that process for every single piece. It's time and patience and effort and attention to detail. And you just repeat that process until you come up with something amazing. And honestly, that's the difference between Dave Hill and every other online wannabe. It's just like, oh, he took the time and the attention to detail and they didn't. developed a process. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so it's just a lot of very small, easy steps that you just repeat. It's more of just, here's a toolbox know when to use what tool mm -hmm. kind of the nasa model like in incredibly elaborate difficult tasks but the philosophy is you can break anything of any difficulty down into small easy tasks and yeah. you'll eventually get there yeah, yeah exactly exactly so but people don't want to do all the tasks indeed uh, so yeah sometimes <laughs> being able to ask stupid questions gives you little easy answers that can launch you into yeah. outer space for so sure there you go. for sure um, next on my list, uh, most important photo thing, the PSB file format. Interesting. <laughs> Photoshop big. Big. <laughs> so uh, the photo that is right behind Stuart's head, uh, this photo that I took in Iceland, the Photoshop file for that is about 13 gigabytes. 
pretty hefty. Um, needless to say, it does not fit the <laughs> PSD um, format. It is PSB, as in big. Um, so yeah, PSB files. Um, I'm actually do, uh, doing a job for a client right now where I have about 15 to 20 different uh, files for them. Mm-hmm. And between these 15 to 20 different files, I have to kick out something like uh, 80 to 100 assets per file um, because it's all these kind of accessories for an online e-commerce site. And each one of their file, the smallest one is about six gigs. And I think the biggest one is like nine and a half gigs. And Pretty big. Photoshop PSB makes that all possible. So I just have these insanely large Photoshop files. Um, because once upon a time, I went to um, a seminar with Burt Monroe, who is an excellent digital illustrator. And he will have a Photoshop file of a nut. <laughs> like like a bull he, he does illustration yeah, yeah. right but his illustration is so intense that if you see a city scene where there's a very small train you can zoom in so far on that train that you can see the rust on the individual rivets on the thing that's cool and so he'll have one photoshop file for that and then he had to like turn that into a smart object or whatever and then um he and basically it, he repeats it a bunch of times, but then he has another Photoshop file for this thing. And he has kind of all of these layered nested things because way back once upon a time, you didn't, you had this four gigabyte cap yep, of yep. files and he was going over that massively. Someday it's going to happen again. Then Adobe is going to re- release PSC for Photoshop chonk. <laughs> <laughs> love it love it i think we need to break the two terabyte file system barrier for that i think i think that's the, i think that's the next barrier oh man <laughs> oh i'm just thinking how big my server array is gonna have to be to make that happen and it makes me cry a little bit inside mm. oh man fun times um all right next up uh number num- what is it number seven i think i think so i think so okay uh number seven on my list uh, I'm going to read the title of it. it. This is awkward. The Manfrotto Air Cushioned Compact Stand Quick Stack. Not sponsored. Hashtag not sponsored, which I've got just a couple of them. Just a few. Just I, I own just a few of these. <laughs> <laughs> um, For those of us that are listening and not watching, there's at least... Uh, how many are there? Uh, Se- seven? seven. Yeah, seven. And I think I have two more in my photo bag over there that mm-hmm. I forgot to pull So you're out. approaching 10. Um, <laughs> I, I've got... I, I love this stand so much. Also, uh, once upon a time, I broke one of these. Um, like the knob doesn't lock anymore or something. Mm-hmm. So I gave it to Trina because it's a great wig stand. She puts her oh, wig nice. on it and now she can use it to like detangle for her costuming stuff. But um, yeah, not only do I love these stands, they're air cushioned, they're strong, they're sturdy, they're super lightweight, which is good when you're trying to travel with them, bad when you're trying to put something heavy on them. But you know, that's physics for yeah. you. But they click together and they stack in a row. Do you think you could transport seven stands in this small e- no you'd have to mm-hmm. have a bag or an accessory carrier and they'd all just be jingling along and they would take up at least three times that much space very cool i own none of these but i probably should <laughs> so um i i realized recently i i love this stand way too much um to the point where i bought more of them even though i i have a problem i probably don't need this many but they're super useful so well hopefully they keep keep making them to that standard it's gonna yeah. be like a it's gonna be like a lens mount shift I, if I you have to my, buy a new I one i bought my first one like 10 years ago and i bought my most oh, okay. recent one like last month so, so they're holding to it you know what yeah yeah they're sticking around they're sticking around um number eight the think tank speed belt so this is just a big ah. fancy padded belt that you wear but then you can add all of these attachments and pouches to it um for the longest time i thought 300 dollars for a belt this is stupid i hate it i'm never buying one and then uh time- is it made out of like alligator skin so it's 300 uh, i i believe it is <laughs> only endangered species dodo uh, bird okay, feathers. okay. yeah right. um, worth it that, then. that's that's where all the padding comes from <laughs> diamonds <laughs> yeah <laughs> it, it, only the finest swarovski crystals for all of these padded cases no we we joke but but it, it for the longest time i'm like this is silly this is stupid i hate it um mm-hmm. at that same time i also had a camera bag for all my c stands and when i say camera bag what i mean is golf it was a golf bag nice and i put all my c stands in it 
But the pat, um, I remember one time I moved it about 10 minutes just to the car mm-hmm. and I had completely broken out from the sweat Ugh. and the weight of the, I'm like, this isn't working anymore. <laughs> I need, I need something that's better. I need something that's uh, not getting destroyed. What I you need, need is a golf with, cart with wheels. <laughs> Uh, so then I bought the think tank stand bag and it was kind of that same thing where like, Oh man, like I have this backpack, but my particular backpack, I had to set it down on the ground and open it from the back to be able to get everything out of it. Uh, kind of clunky. I did recently buy a bag that is for city. So you can just like pull stuff out of the side. Hmm. But I don't like that because I often try to pick it up and the backside's open and all my crap falls off and oh, I'm damaging my hmm. gear. Not so good. Yeah. I'm, I'm still not a fan of that. Anyway, Hmm. But um, I finally got around to buying it because I had to shoot on a public transit and I didn't oh. want to have to like set all my stuff down. I'm like, oh, I'm, yeah. you know what? This will come in handy. I'll just bite the bullet. And it was the best thing ever. <laughs> I use it at every wedding. I use it basically pretty much any time I go out. Nine he sleeps tenths, in it. I, I sleep <laughs> in it. Yeah, just just huge chunky belt. My 72, <laughs> is that a 7200 in your pocket or are you happy to see me? <laughs> <laughs> um, exactly um but yeah no uh i realized this is stupid expensive but it is absolutely worth it i was an idiot and i should have bought it sooner it saved my back it made me um more versatile it made me faster it made me more efficient more organized it made me look more professional it just like 100 percent worth it and you just have to bite the bullet sometime and buy the good thing yep yep buy once yeah. cry once yeah uh number nine the westcott rapid box um yeah i i give westcott a lot of crap bring it up westcott in the top 10 yeah westcott in my top 10 i i have had this on my video to do a best and worst of westcott video um i heard on youtube comments that you're a westcott hater uh yes oh my god (laughs) yeah uh that is one of my most popular videos (laughs) And not for the reasons you think. People hate it so much. Anyway, uh, no, the Westcott Rapid Box is phenomenal, and I bring it with me pretty much everywhere. Um, just Google it. See, he's not a Westcott hater, confirmed. Google it. Yeah, there you go. And number 10. Okay, this one, I, I had a hard time kind of coming up up with stuff, and I realized this one is just sentimental to me. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is the camera strap by Vulture Equipment Works, which I happen to have with me right here. So is this particularly useful or give me any functionality beyond a normal camera strap? No. Does it look dope as hell? Yeah, it does. It's got big D-rings on it for yeah, those of us listening. It is basically made of like um, military pilot strap it's it's um advertises like um the same thing that people would have for helicopters um and it's like a harness got, like it's even got the quick release thing oh cool um, those are cool i i have mine still tied down because i don't want to quick release it that would mm-hmm. be a bad day for me <laughs> um but but yeah so i just love this strap so much because it makes me feel badass as i'm wearing it and people are just like ooh, it's an interesting um and for me, it was, um, I kind of saw it, but it was like $150 or something. Ooh, okay. And and it felt frivolous. And mm-hmm. I'm like, obviously, I'm not going to, I have the strap that came with my camera. Why mm-hmm. would mm-hmm. I do that? But um, I kind of set that as like an income benchmark milestone. I'm like, once I reach this level, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it anyway. I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to buy the frivolous <laughs> thing. And now, like, it's still a lot of money, but... Compared to all the other crap I've bought, $150 is a drop in the bucket. And hey, if it gets you in the groove. Yeah. yeah. And so I just love this strap because it makes me feel awesome. Um, and that is going to be different for everyone. Some people do Black Rapid stuff. Like, um, I wish they would have given me swag that I could use. <laughs> do a comparison. That, w- that, that would have been nice. Um, so when you got your belt and you got your strap, you're good to go. Yeah, honestly. Um so no, it was just one of those things that like it it makes me feel cool and it's it's total vanity, but um it's just yeah, I made it. I'm I'm gonna have the cool thing. Just For sure. Sometimes you get the cool thing. Yeah. There you go. There you go. That's it. So that top is my ten. that is my top ten uh favorite things of all time. And now we enter part three of our show. <laughs> where we will poorly explain what we do for a living. Yes, we will. All right. Stuart, poorly explain what you do for a living. 
Well, you already said it. Poorly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a light collection and pixel arrangement specialist. I'm an importer exporter. Ah, I see what you did. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I charge money for what Uncle Bob does for free. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's with that? I'm a professional stand organizer. Ooh. Uh, I listen to people telling me that I have such a great camera. <laughs> well, I yell at clouds. <laughs> it's true. Darn clouds. It, it can be really annoying <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> I record what people do while under the influence. Oh, boy. <laughs> well, I make art out of gaff tape. I take photos of properties no one can afford so someone overseas can buy it as a status symbol and never spend any time there. Ooh, that's I, I feel like we need literally our too sound close again. to home. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, I capture a moment in liminal space. Uh, I hit one button on a black box and then I move that to a different black box and hit more buttons. Man, that's so many careers. <laughs> uh, yeah. I work for exposure. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> that, that one hurt <laughs> that one hurts deeply <laughs> i leave people suddenly questioning what to do with their hands i trap photons in quantum wells uh according to most people my camera takes such good photos and photoshop fixes the rest so i guess i don't actually do that much yeah especially since uncle bob is doing it for free i i know right <laughs> i watch the markets the hard drive markets. Yeah, you do. <laughs> Very <laughs> he's, much. He's my hard drive hookup every time they go on <laughs> sale. True story. Uh, I produce and arrange pixels of various colors in a manner that when viewed by a human, release chemicals in the brain that cause emotion. Ooh, deep. I'm a pack mule. Ditto. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm an unlicensed therapist. <laughs> I'm the shoulder people shoot phone photos over. Oh, <laughs> Yeah, very true. Uh, I arrange people in groups and flash them. Ooh, spicy. I attach things to other things in increasingly ridiculous situations. <laughs> I shine bright lights in people's eyes and tell them to smile. I know what a click costs. Uh, I complain how broke I am while about holding 10 grand worth of gear. <laughs> this is why I'm broke. <laughs> Hashtag, this is why I'm broke. All right, so thank you, everyone, <laughs> for sticking it out for this extra long, extra special episode 100 extravaganza. Yay! Yay! <laughs> um, in case you missed it earlier, if you would like to support this show moving forward, you can do so with the tip jar on my Patreon, patreon.com slash nomcreative. Thank you guys all so much. We have uh, one more listener question kind of in the queue, but if you have any questions, uh, all of that info will be in the outro. Thank you guys so much for listening. This has been a phenomenal journey so far. We're coming up on like two years of doing this podcast. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This is great. Um, yeah, just seriously, we couldn't do it without... Um, I absolutely f- just feed on all of your feedback and creativity. <laughs> um, someone commented on one of these podcasts on the YouTube channel. Um, how does this absolutely perfect video only have 71 views? And I'm like, oh, yes. Thank you. That'll keep me going for another 50 <laughs> episodes. Thank you so much. Um, t- seriously, everyone, um, go support that Patreon. Click like, subscribe, share with a friend. Let us know what you want to see next time. We will see you in the next episode. Here's to 100 episodes and now to 100 hours. Whenever that is. Episode 178 or something, probably. Let's, let's do one minute episodes and it'll be episode 4,000. <laughs> and... no, <laughs> if you have questions or ideas for future episodes, you can email us at hello at photo dash op dot show. Watch us on Ben's YouTube channel at Nom Creative. As in Om Nom Nom. Share this with a friend and you can listen to Photo Op anywhere podcasts are sold. Or downloaded. Because it's free.